How can you not be romantic about baseball? It's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. Hi there, and welcome to Baseball by Design. I am SportsLogos.net minor league baseball correspondent Paul Caputo, broadcasting live, as always, from the Sunday Helmet Hall of Fame in my basement in Fort Collins, Colorado. Today, we are going to be talking about the brand new independent Pioneer League Oakland Ballers, who, of course, play in Oakland, California. Later on in this episode, I'll be speaking with Jorge Leon of the Oakland 68s. And, of course, Dan Simon will be here with one of his Studio Simon Stumpers. Right now, I am so pleased to welcome to the podcast Brian Carmel, who is the co-founder of the Oakland Ballers, and Dustin Canelin, who is the creative services director, the designer, the the grand poobah of all things graphic design for the ballers. Hey, you said I could use whatever, Dustin. It's, uh, so yeah, I, w- I went it. with it. <laughs> um, we are here talking about the Oakland Ballers. Obviously, baseball by design is about logos and nicknames and what they mean to the to the local community. There's a lot going on in Oakland with the world of baseball right now. So I think this is a, a pretty special topic to be to be talking about. The Ballers are a Pioneer League team. Uh, I am still, still, still waiting for my first knockout round in a Pioneer League game. Haven't gotten there yet. Brian, let's start with you. The Ballers, where does the nickname Ballers come from? Why, why is a Pioneer League team in Oakland called the Ballers? Sure. Uh, great question. We're, so we're called the Ballers, but sometimes we also go by the Bees. You can see the Bee in my hat. Um, mm-hmm. There's another baseball team in Oakland. It's not there for much longer, but they have a different letter, and it's the letter that comes before B. And so we just figured if if the A team's leaving, then why not bring in the B team? And it kind of started with that. And at the same time, um, you know, the, my co-founder, uh, Paul Friedman, and I, we, 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 we grew up in East Bay, went to high school together in Oakland. And um, we had a, a very dear friend named Bobby Winslow, who unfortunately passed away just after we all graduated college. We, you know, he went to high school with us and he um, he always called himself a baller. And in fact, in Berkeley, there's this part, there's this basketball court that we named after him. It's called Bobby Winslow Court. And there's this plaque there that says, you know, I'm, I'm always a baller um, as a quote from Bobby. And so we just decided early on June of last year, when we first came up with the idea of starting a baseball team, all right, it's going to be the bees, the ballers, and we're going to dedicate the team to Bobby. So that's, that's where it came from. So I wasn't familiar with this other baseball team that you're talking about in Oakland, but uh, I did Google it and it turns out there is one. And, uh, uh, they've got a a green and yellow brand similar to the green and yellow that you're wearing Brian right now. I'll turn this question over to to Dustin. Obviously, in the context of you know what's going on in Oakland with baseball right now, uh, at the time of this recording, they the the Athletics Ball Club, I guess, just uh, released their 2025 schedule for all the games they're going to be playing in Sacramento next year. So, Dustin, for you as a, the designer for for this team, there's obviously it's not a secret that the that part of what's so great about the ballers existence is that it gives baseball fans in in Oakland, a a professional baseball outlet. How much do you play off of the soon to be previous team in Oakland and, and how much of what you're trying to create as a brand identity for this team is new and original and specific to the ballers? Um, Great question. I think uh, it started with our process you know, when, when the guys kind of hit me up to be part of this project, like the one thing that I wanted to do was to make sure that I looked into the past and see that why things were the way they were. And with the color palette in general, like that predated that other team. So it's really part of the community. Um, and with everything that we've done with the logo, the marks, the colors, everything, like we wanted to take what the culture of Oakland is and turn that into an identity like a new batch per se it's like i told uh i told everyone i was like hey this hat needs to be like the representation of like hey i'm from oakland you know like this this has to be that and it it stemmed all the way through the process it's it's how we communicate on the jersey where oakland is on the backs of everyone like there's this real 
message, heartfelt message to the people of Oakland that, hey, we are here to represent you. And this is um, your team. Yeah, and I, I just want to add one thing about the color palette. You know, uh, Dustin mentioned that the colors predate that other baseball team. That other baseball team came in 1968. The colors have been Oakland since 1952. You know, the city council in 1952 held, I believe, a contest to design the Oakland flag. Yeah. And, um, of, you know, and the oak tree, the iconic Oakland flag uh, was the winner. And the colors, um, they're not really sure. People have dug into like, where do the colors come from? But the best guess, according to a historical record in Oakland from the archives and the Oakland Public Library is that it represents the Golden Hills, you know, and green for the green trees because Oakland was heavily forested in the early days. The Pioneer League has largely been in the mountain states. Uh, that's where I live. I'm based in Fort Collins, Colorado. The nearest affiliated baseball to me is a seven-hour drive in several directions. If I go to Salt Lake, Omaha, or Albuquerque, it's basically seven hours to get to affiliated baseball. Whereas, you know, the Pioneer League, I've got several teams closer than that, including my Northern Colorado Owls with a Z right around the corner. The ballers are local to Oakland. It's part of the Oakland baseball story. However, it has become a significant story out there nationwide in, in the baseball world, I, I, even beyond the nation. I was in London for the London series because I'm a Phillies fan, and there, there were cell signs. I actually have a picture of me holding a cell sign, right? So how, how do you shoulder the responsibility of, of being an independent professional team in the, the Pioneer League, but also being part of this huge national story about this disaster for major league baseball and you know what's going on in oakland oh yeah okay let's <laughs> let's unpack that one uh, I, um, so I, I asked I, like nine things in that question i'm sorry I, I had a i had a lot on my mind coming into this episode well uh, uh we took it i i think we 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 um intuited the importance of the role that we were stepping into i'll start with that you know i think oakland is a historic fan base it's a fan base that has a lot of pride in community and pride in the love that we bring to our sports teams and you know it's a historic fan base it's a fan base that's lost three pro sports teams in the last five years yeah. and is hurting and we felt like how do we move on past that hurt you know can we start a new chapter for pro sports and for baseball in oakland and so that's what we intended to do yes it's a different kind of experiment and value proposition than other pioneer league teams which are in the rockies and smaller communities but um but i think that like you know oakland no oaklanders nobody wants to tell folks in oakland that we can or can't have baseball in oakland and so for us it was just really important to build a team with the community and on our own terms and so we've tried to bring authenticity and community involvement into every aspect from Dustin's incredible designs to the way we've, you know, constructed Ramondi Park in a, in a municipal park in partnership with the city and the community um, to the way we've constructed our fan experience in partnership with, you know, fan groups like the Last Dive Bar and the Oakland 68s. It's really like when we say that, you know, our, 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 lo our motto for season one is built by Oakland and we really mean that we are a team that is constructed by Oakland, you know, we needed somebody to design our amazing um, brand marks and logos. And so Dustin was, you know, number one, two, and three on our list because he is, you know, he's a local guy and he gets it. He knows what Oakland's all about. He's also an incredible designer. And I want to give one more plug for Dustin. I don't know, you know, Paul, if it, this guy, like Dustin created, Dustin has done jerseys for a lot of NBA teams. I think the Sixers and the Bulls, is that right, Dustin? And the, and yeah. the Timberwolves, Wolves, and that's a, a, a lot of them. A lot, yeah. yeah. He's he is yeah. He is like be the Glo the Harlem Globetrotters. Also, he created what I think is the most iconic NBA jersey of all time, which is the Golden State Warriors, the town jersey. Wow. Dustin created that. Yeah. So he when we were like that is the guy because the NBA is obviously doing something right. He's doing the greatest designs in the NBA, and we wanted to kind of bring some of that. Um, some of that audience and visual look and authenticity to baseball too. Sorry, I had to give that plug. I know I'm so, super glad that you did, Brian. That's all. I'm so glad to know that. And I, now I'll know my Sixers. Their their jerseys were were created by by Dustin Cannell and amazing. 
Dustin, this this design too. Brian Brian mentions your the the amazing design. It's uh, it's a really terrific brand. You don't see a lot in minor league baseball of just strictly type based brands. And I think with with ballers, you could have gone with like the the cartoon baseball and like there's a lot of sort of silliness you could have brought to this and and you did not. The the strictly typographic logo does have some you know uh, iconography in it. There's obviously the the home plate is is built in there, but it's a very distinctive letter B that I think references the the A's A, but is certainly not based off that A's A. So with at the risk of delving into another long question, I'm just going to ask you: What were your considerations when you when you crafted uh, this this very specific looking letter B? Um, well, initially just in the name in general, and just the fact that it was going from an A to a B, like there's cheekiness in that already. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I love sports logos in, in general, just like a huge fan of minor league logos forever. Um, so I knew that that was an avenue, but I also think that like, I didn't want this to be a joke. Mm -hmm. So I would always tell these guys, I was you know, thinking that there just needs to be like the level of confidence and swagger that Oakland has as a people. And I think that's where we wanted it to be iconic, like in an icon that was serious. So that's why the angles are the way that they are. They're, they're kind of modeled a little bit off of like old English, but at the same time, like having the boldness where it kind of could stand on its own. And then, like you said, the, the home plate representing home and being part of that where it's not at the forefront like people from Oakland aren't as boastful as you would think like they're boastful internally a lot and they don't like to like wear their feathers out as much so I think that that was that was the whole mentality behind it and I think that we landed in a place where um we were all comfortable because I think you know I think those guys too of like actually believing in the thought process because there were a lot of low hanging fruit ideas that we could have done. Um, but to push this like a little further, like, you know, I love creating brands and I love creating identities. And I think that this one for me had so much meaning behind it that, you know, I really feel like this could end up being, you know, the badge for Oaklanders forever. Absolutely. And and we're focusing uh, on the, the cap logo but there's you know very specific looking typography in the the primary brand uh with the the all caps very distinctive looking Oakland and with the old English e sort of a modernized old English almost in the mm -hmm. in the in the primary logo that typography is a little bit different from what's on the 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 B's cap what was your thinking in in making that one you know distinct from the the B's on the cap um just aesthetically contrast just to have both that can like live together but be different you know like it's kind of a stew of people in Oakland um and I think that we wanted all of these pieces to kind of build a family so even with the numbers that were created like all all of the thing was was very purposeful and um uh I think the the boldness and the confidence like was the the main reason of why they are kind of squared off and bold and you know not to get like tight and nerdy but just like the sans serif bold like traditional sports um numbers just needed an update like they just needed like a vibe and i think that like adding these little nuances to it that you may not get right away but you see like once it comes together like on a uniform with all three pieces and it's like you're not like Oakland here, Oakland here, Oakland here. It's not like logo mania all around it. Mm -hmm. Like it really builds in a 360 degree way uh, and like coming into the ballpark and seeing the B, but then the signage is different. And like, it really kind of brings everything together. And, you know, like, I think the word Oakland, like being from there, people are so proud to wear that on their chest. So mm -hmm. giving them that option as a logo too, where it's, you know, like we we're saying, like this is represent representative of Oakland, the people of Oakland, not just the team. So this expands beyond just baseball. Absolutely. And Dustin, feel free to go type nerdy anytime that you want on this podcast. <laughs> that's that's what we do. <laughs> One more question for Dustin here. Uh, the uh, I, I absolutely love the the jerseys and, uh, you know, 
Maybe it's because I'm not from Oakland, though I like Oakland very much. I really, really like the uh, the. I guess it's dark green, not black, but it says ballers across the front. What a classic jersey for like anyone who is just a fan of, I guess, baseball. <laughs> it's just to get a jersey that says ballers. But in general, my question about the 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 jerseys and the and the look. Again, very classic, a lot of solid colors. There's a real traditional baseball feeling to the uniforms that is, you know, it's not silly minor league baseball. It is it is professional and sort of classic feeling. I'm sure, and that, you know, but this I said this was a question for Dustin, but this is really a question for, for both of you. Uh, as a franchise, as a baseball organization, why was it important to you to go with a, a classic baseball feeling rather than a silly minor league baseball experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is this there is this trend in minor league baseball to make logos as kind of outrageous and silly and adding a bunch of adjectives to the front. And it's, you know, um, the raging bulldozing Cajuns of whatever um, Birmingham. And I, uh, I have that hat. It's, yeah, it, it, <laughs> uh, I think that that's just not Oakland. And mm. I think that um, we it, it's like. Dustin said in the beginning, and I, you know, I think he did a, a really great job challenging us. And we, we, we had a really, really tight and efficient, but hugely necessary dialogue in a very compressed amount of time when we built this thing together. And I think that it was about what is, what, what's going to resonate with the people of Oakland. And it, it, it was so important to, you know, land the plane correctly because um, it is a place that can have an allergic reaction to something that is not just right for Oakland. And so we, you know, we take ourselves really seriously. We take the legacy that we are humbly asking if we can sort of carry the torch on very seriously. And so we wanted, you know, we wanted to have that gravitas and it's got to feel like a baseball team and a, and a baseball um, jersey because that's what we are. At the same time, you know, I think when, when you come to our ballpark, it's at Romandi, it's like a 4,100 seat ballpark. It's kind of throwback to the way that there used to be like community baseball teams every, you know, in the 1930s, 40s. And I recommend if you can get through it, Ken Burns's very long baseball documentary series. But, you know, every team, every union, every factory had its own baseball team that was you know, an expression of, it was how a community expressed its ident shared identity. And we are trying to harken back to times like that. And we wanted to, you know, I think that in big baseball, things have gotten, um, fans aren't always necessarily fully um, centered anymore. And we wanted to create a team that centers fans. And, you know, I think that eliminating the walls between fan bases and teams is going to be really paramount to that and so we're we're kind of going back to a time where um where community where, where teams really were part of the fabric of a community obviously pro sports is moving in a different direction now we've seen 30 pro teams leave their their city in the last eight decades mm -hmm. something is probably broken in like the social contract between teams and fan bases and we're trying to you know create a new model where the fan base and the team are inextricably tied together. And so I think part of that was going back to a time and visually as well with, as you're talking about the, the jerseys that Dustin created, you know, it should feel a little bit throwback. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, from a, from a design perspective, like just me um, aesthetically, it's like, I tend to be more classic um, just because the timelessness of things have always what I've gravitated towards. And I think that, you know, with a lot of these um, like newer Major League Baseball uniforms and, you know, just me being on the Nike side before and seeing like the amount of like work and craftsmanship that go into like telling these grandiose stories, like sometimes they're a little bit too um, illustrated on a uniform. And it's like people have to wear these things, mm. you know what I mean? And I think with Oakland, it's like especially growing up there, it's like you would get made fun of if you had something stupid on and i think that there's a seriousness to like a uniform where you know our uniform growing up was like black jeans and a white t-shirt and a raider hat or a, or a hat, uh, a's hat you know it's like there's there's simplicity there and i think that 
there's all the same amount of storytelling that's going on that you really have to be have an intimate um, experience with. And that to me is always like, oh, I think we hit the nail on the head because, you know, it does it does create the question like, what is that? Like, what is the bees? Like when you get, when you see the pants up close, like they're pinstripes, but they're kind of based off the Oakland tree logo. So like, there's all of these like nuances and, and stories or the home plate that's hidden in there. It's like all these like talking points that you can, you can have a conversation about, not see from, you know, a 50 foot vantage point where it's like, okay, great. Like that's trendy for now, but like, how is this going to look? in 10 years and 20 years like this is this is something where you know you're, you want to create like family heirlooms not you know one-off uh disposable jerseys yeah uh yeah 100 percent uh, i've got one more question for each of you i know we've or we're already over the time i said that we were going to be but uh, i'm just loving this conversation dustin for you minor league baseball brands grow and change with time you know, there, there's room here. Uh, you know, I think you've got a, you know, the the super strong primary brand. You've got the very recognizable uh, cap logo. Are you toying with uh, alternate brands or you know, uh, you know, alternate looks? I mean, obviously not like the, you know, you're going to be like the Oakland French fries, you know, on a weekend or whatever. But like, you know, will this brand? Are there are there any plans in store to have you know sort of tweaks to this brand? At, at, you know, as you as the team grows. Yeah, that was that was part of the plan, right? Like we wanted we wanted to kind of show diversity throughout. So the goal, especially for the first year, um, was to establish the look and like really kind of create this like classic modern look. And then, you know, we'll splice up like changing colors with for special moments and adding themes to certain, you know, like events. Like there's there's a ton in the pipeline. Um but I think that, you know, the conversation that we're having, like, is very meaningful to me about just creating something classic and iconic, that, like someone else has kind of seen it as that. So then when we apply color or like pull the different levers, um, it's still all on brand, you know what I mean? So it's, it's really establishing the canvas for, for the future. And there's no rules, you know, like, that's the great thing about this team and, and, and the people behind it. It's like, we don't have to do anything like the, there, there doesn't have to be boundaries ever. So if like we want to tweak something like we'll tweak it for the right reasons. Um, but, you know, I think we're excited just to kind of see it out. Like I've seen it at airports like all over, you know, just like uh, like you were saying, you saw it in London. I, I recently saw it in in Amsterdam. So oh, wow. it, it's pretty crazy to kind of see like, you know, where where it's starting to show up from this one place. And especially because I'm so close to it that uh, when you start seeing it other places, it's like, oh, wow, like this is this is really happening. Nice. Brian, similarly for you, we're, you know, we're, we're partway into the, the team's first season. And, uh, you know, you've been very explicit in interviews that I've read in other uh, outlets about the ballers are not trying to be a one-for-one -one replacement for the A's, that they're trying to provide a, a new, unique baseball experience for, for Oakland fans. Here we are, you know, roughly halfway through the first season at the at the time of this recording how have you done establishing that that baseball experience for for Oakland fans and what might change you know as you look to the future yeah i mean it's an it, it, it's an interesting year and you know uh i've never done this before so i didn't know what to expect um i think that a a, a couple of things strike me one is that like at every game people come up to me that I haven't met before and they just um, thank me and they do it to the, they do it to Paul. They do it to other members of our front office and our players and our coaches. And they're like, thank you for what you've done for the community. And it's, it's really wild. Like there's something beyond just, there's a new baseball team here. And I think it's um, I think it's a story. And I think it's a, um, a message about the way that fans and teams can build together instead of, you know, in opposition. And I think that um, that is really taking hold in all sorts of ways that I hadn't anticipated. I think that like, that we're also a, a startup and it's really hard and we built a, a stadium really fast and we don't have huge budgets for things like marketing. And so we're still also just like do, doing the nuts and bolts things to get the word out and make sure that people know 
um, that, you know, it's a great time at the ballpark. Um, so, uh, you know, I think next year we're the only pro baseball game in town. This year we're not. There's another one. And I think that'll be really – so I think people are having all the feelings this year. Last year was really tough. Um, there was this, you know, like there was the sell T-shirts and there was the movement, you know, um, it, it, the fan activation around that. And I think that took a big emotional toll in the community. This year is this transition period. I also stand at the gates every day and thank people for coming and ask if they had a good time. And people are, people are like, that was amazing. I've never been anything like that. Like if you're a kid and you want to, and you want to get a foul ball and you come to a ballers game, you're going to get a foul, <laughs> foul ball. There is plenty of balls. And then you're going to get it signed by whichever players you want. Like, and these kids, it's like, you see their eyes popping out that they have this much access to the players and the team. So I think that it's experiential in that way. And it feels like much more like you're meeting people. It's, you know, uh, we're, we're still, we're still building on that. We're still figuring out like, what are the, what, what are the building blocks towards creating that perfect fan experience? But so far, I, you know, I think, I think we've done really well and we're just going to build from here. And my hope is that we, you know, we aim to be the, the pro baseball team in Oakland. And we also aim to be um, uh, an enduring cultural institution in Oakland. And we're, we humbly offer ourselves like at the gates of all of the other major cultural institutions from, you know, um, the museum to the Oakland Zoo to the symphony and, you know, the Black Panther Party, like everybody that represents what Oakland is all about. And we are, um, we're, we're, we're the new guys and we just want to help be part of like a, a good future for the city and for the East Bay. Guys, this has been a ton of fun. I really appreciate you hanging on a couple extra minutes uh, beyond what we uh, said we were going to go. Brian, where can we find uh, you and the and the team online? And then Dustin, I'll ask you the same question. Where can folks find the work that you do online? Sure. So you can find all information about us at www.oaklandballers.com. You know, we also just announced um, our test the waters phase for our crowdfunding and last week, and that's been we. Uh, well over indexed our expectations kind of insanely so so um uh you know i think that's invest.oaklandballers.com and um if folk, folks get a chance to become a fan owner and i think what's different about our value proposition is that in addition to actually having value in the team we're offering fans a real seat at the table that means meaningful input in you know the brand marks and logos should they change um can the team move where, where the team is located and even some, you know, um, key front office decisions. So that's been, that's, that, that, that goes back to what we're trying to do in terms of creating a new model for how fans and uh, teams, how communities and teams uh, co coexist and build value together. Uh, you could find me on Instagram at Dustin um, Quick Philly note. It's like I spent a lot of time in Philly living there for a few years, but I was named after Dr. J. So my initials are DOC. Um, <laughs> Amazing. So that's just like a fun bit. And then I also own a clothing line called Trophy Hunting, where it's a um, lifestyle apparel, um, all encompassing. So that's where Amazing. I'm at. Amazing. And I would be remiss, I would be remiss if I didn't say that all of our hats and jerseys, those that haven't sold out, our t-shirts, all of that, that's available at oaklandish.com. Yes. Oaklandish o a k l a n d i s h dot com. Guys, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh best of luck the rest of this season and, and in coming seasons. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right, everyone, welcome back. I am so pleased right now to have on the podcast Jorge Leon, who is the president of the Oakland 68s. So, Jorge, before we start talking about the, you know, the, the ballers and the roots and, and uh, you know, sports in Oakland right now, can you tell me what the 68s are? What is the Oakland 68s? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. um, so, the Oakland 68s, um, you know, we were. We, we were a group of friends um, that we started this. Um, we're basically right now is a nonprofit organization, um, uh, but we've known each other since probably what the late 90s, early 2000s by going to these o Oakland A's games. Um, we are uh, as much fans of the team as we are with the city of Oakland. 
Um, and so we are also soccer fans. And so then we kind of, you know, we were all, we were first called the, the field bleacher diehards, right field, left field bleacher diehards. And then we kind of, um, as, as the years passed on, we were kind of like, oh, you know, we should become a, um, a supporters group, kind of like similar to what you see in soccer stadiums all, all across Europe and, and even out here with MLS. And so we were like, yeah, let's 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 get a little more organized. And so then in 2017, um, you know, we came up with the the, the name, the Oakland 68s, uh, which is kind of uh, it, it, people think that's from the from the Oakland A's landing in Oakland in 1968, but it's actually because we support everything sports in Oakland. It's actually because of the Olympics in Mexico in 1968, and then having to do so with all the social events that were. Uh, happening during that time with the Black Panther movement, with John Carlos at the Olympics, uh, holding the, the fist up in the air, uh, and Tommy Smith, and and, um, and 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 obviously the A's landing in Oakland in 1968. So that's how we came up with the name. Um, and we're primarily, you know, focused on sports and the community around Oakland. And we became a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit in 2020. And so uh we're we're still the same people except we've grown exponentially with uh, a lot of members across the nation we have some in in europe we have some in japan that's who we are man. we support our teams in oakland and and we we're the drummers we're the we're waving flags we're uh chanting and and yeah that's the oakland 68 obviously you know sports fandom in in oakland right now uh, is, there's no two ways to say it, right? Like what what the Oakland A's have done to this community is just so wrong. It's so unfair, and yeah. to see to see you all banding together and 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 finding joy in you know the the sports scene that does exist there, you know that that's a really inspirational story to follow. Tell me your perception of the sports fan in Oakland. Who is the the typical Oakland sports fan? Oh man, that's a great question. I feel like if I could if I could blend it all in, it's 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 the Oakland sixty eight standing tall, not not letting the negativity surrounding, you know, obviously the community and 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 everything that happens in and around Oakland, but also supports, you know, your local sports teams like the Oakland Roots, the the uh, the Oakland Soul, the 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 people that volunteer for soccer camps for uh, the the Oakland Athletic League and um um and and people that don't that don't give up that that can uplift each other a very diverse group um or a person and so so to me it can be it it literally it's hard to explain it it's hard to say just that one person right because we're so diverse in in all ethnic backgrounds and in all walks of life that like it's hard to just say that's your sports fan but that if you could just put it in a in a in a in a blender that's who we are that's that's who it is that's that person that that smiling that that it it loves the passion that comes out that you see uh uh, in baseball day in and day out and in, in soccer every Saturday or Sunday. Um, heck, even even with the Raiders when they were in town, you know, that that was the passion that you would see all the time. And so uh, um, that's to me, that's an Oakland, an Oakland uh, uh, a sports fan and, and honestly, an East Bay uh, sports fan, because we, we forget that that, you know, Oakland is obviously the, the, the bigger city, but in the East Bay, it's it's we forget about the rest of the cities that 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 surrounds it. Uh, East Bay as a whole, that, that's who we are. We are the underdogs. <laughs> when we scheduled this interview, uh, you uh, you said you wanted to make sure it was happening on an evening when there were no Oakland sports events happening. And so we, had to, <laughs> yeah. you know, we looked at the schedule and we figured it out. Obviously, the, the Oakland Roots are a men's soccer team. The Oakland Soul is a women's soccer team. This episode of Baseball by Design is about the Oakland Ballers, which is the obviously the new Pioneer League baseball team. What is the environment there? And you know, having been a long time uh, A's fan, what how does it compare? Uh, how does the experience now compare to you know what you experienced in the in the bleachers in uh, at A's games? It's a great question, and I always tell folks that you know the the Coliseum was always. Um, was always meant to be kind of this car centric place where, you know, you would get in and get out real fast. And, and, and I love East Oakland. That's where I was born. 
um, and uh, born and raised. And so then to, to kind of, to, you know, to put the Coliseum there and then not kind of spend any money after a game or anything like that, it kind of defeats the purpose of kind of uplifting that community. Right. So um, I'm, uh, first, I, I just want to say I'm so happy that the Roots and Soul announced today that they're going to keep playing at the Coliseum in 2025. So that's pretty cool. But going back to the Ballers, uh, that vibe is, it, it, to me, in my opinion, because I've been to Wrigley Field, um, I've been to uh, I've been to Philadelphia as well, um, and and even Safeco Field. Um, that that ballpark there, Raymondi, and and I know it's an independent ball club. It's, it feels so much like a neighborhood ballpark, like the, the Wrigley Field. Like you, you, you have to go and, and actually walk around this neighborhood of West Oakland um, and, and see all the people that live around there, that the businesses that, that, that it's going to open or, or are there right now. Um, and the vibes we, we bring in our side of it, right. With, with the chanting, the drumming and, and, and the tailgating. I mean, the tailgating didn't stop. We're, we're still there underneath the oak tree, you know, tailgating with, with people we love and people we love hanging out with. So uh, those vibes are, are, are still amazing. And, and it's very, like I said, very neighborhood feel to it. Um, I had a buddy that he stopped going to two, two buddies that stopped going to A's games uh, since like 20, 2019, 2020 after the wild card game, because with all this Vegas stuff that was going on, he didn't want to. He didn't feel like going to a baseball game, and then he eventually came back to the Ballers, and he fell in love. Um, and I, that's how that's how I would explain the vibes there. You know, uh, have you been to many Ballers games yet? Yeah, <laughs> been to most of them. Uh, my family, we were longtime A season ticket holders, and we, you know, running the Oakland 68s, we decided as a group to boycott the season. Um, and you know, I meant it. So uh, this was a. Actually, I went to. Tuesday the sixth to kind of protest that game um, with with the majority of the A's fans that were kind of frustrated and wanted to do something. So we said, okay, let's do uh, Tuesday the sixth, and that was my first A's game, and I had already been to you know uh, most of the home games for uh, the Ballers already. Have you gotten to see one of their uh, knockout rounds? I've been I've been going to Pioneer League games for a few years now, and I have not yet seen one of their uh, their knockout uh-huh. rounds. Uh, have you seen one yet? Oh yeah, yep. I saw one in person oh. um, with Andre Hubbard hitting a hitting a bomb against the <laughs> uh, the Owls, or no, sorry, the the Yellow High Wheelers. And interestingly oh, yeah. enough, I was listening to the to the um, to the radio because I'm all in with the Ballers. I'm all in, you know. I'm listening to the radio when the Ballers are playing, or I'm watching on TV if they're away. Um, but yeah, I got to listen to one. And Tyler Peterson did a fantastic job, like narrating that whole thing. And I was kind of up uh, uh, on the edge of my seat on that one. And the Ballers actually won it with a reliever uh, hitting a home run. So, <laughs> yeah, that was it was pretty good. I, I like it. I like it. I'm super jealous. I haven't seen one yet. It's on, it's very much on my bucket list. And like every time it like gets like the seventh and eighth inning, and the game is close, I'm like, come on, come on, this is the one here. The 68s brand is is really fun, and obviously there's a wink and a nod in it to the to the Oakland A's. Uh, you know, you've got it's a it's an elephant uh, with it, but it's a much meaner looking elephant than the A's one was. And then it's got the green hat with the yellow brim, and then the word Oakland in uh, you know pretty uh, sweet looking font. And then the the brand itself. It was interesting that 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 you referenced the Oakland 68s and uh, the Olympics because the I don't know this this brand without looking at the Olympics logo from that year. This the 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 font that you have Oakland sixty eight set in has a kind of a, a Olympic y feeling to it. That was on purpose. Yep. Uh, yeah. So so tell me about that brand. Is, is that elephant? Does that belong to you now instead of the A's? <laughs> uh, so that that elephant was actually uh, what made in twenty twelve, I believe. Uh, by a, a brand company out here called Oaklandish, a clothing company. Okay. Um, and so we were also very, very good, a good, a good, a good relationship with them and, and friends. And so then we kind of, uh, kind of bought him, bought it out from them, or, or, or they they let us have it, have that graphic. And and so again, we we were the first ever supporters group in Major League Baseball. And so to to me, we we felt 
uh, as a group that we were kind of more like the extreme kind of made, uh, baseball fans, right? I mean, there's not a lot of chanting or drumming or flag waving anywhere else. Yeah. Um, and so, and so the, the, the bandana over it is kind of an ode to the, to the ultras in, in soccer. So mm-hmm. in, in soccer, there's the ultras where, where they're very, very more, much more extreme. And, um, and so the meaner thing is kind of more of a, like, you know, to, to kind of, uh, intimidate your opposing, the opposing players that come out and, and, um, and be rough and, 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 and tough, you know, if you're from Oakland. So, uh, and then the, the font, that's a great. Uh, that's a good uh, observation. That's from the uh, Olympics in 1968, and, and like I said, in Mexico, um, I am I am Mexican American, and and uh, my I'm first generation out here. So, uh, you know, it was it was it was great to incorporate that, and 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 a little bit of Oakland, and a little bit of everything. So, Jorge, before I let you go here, I'm curious to know what is your relationship? What is the Oakland 68's relationship with the the ballers themselves? Yeah, so um, it's a good question, and and one you know, uh, Paul and Brian are the owners of the of the um, of the Oakland Ballers and uh, and the High Wheelers, I believe. So they had to have two teams in order to to be in the independent ball uh, independent in the Pioneer Baseball League, and so they they reached out to to us as a uh, to the group. And asked if if we could meet and talk about this new idea, this new baseball team. I had no idea what they wanted to talk about, but you know we're we're always open minded. Um, we're at at the end of the day, we're fans. We love to drink beer and 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 cheer on our our teams, right? So this is the six days is our uh, is our hobby. So um, and so we're like, yeah, let, you know, we'll we'll see what they want to talk about. And then they this is this is this was way back right after the the reverse boycott uh, game that we did. And so they, they got, um, they got so excited from that and, and they, they wanted to do something about that and, and they wanted to fight with us. And so then they, they kind of created this new team and said, you know what, we're not going to let, I know, I know I've always said this too, when the media was always asked me, we're like, Oh, what's next in Oakland? And I said, I said, you know what, this is not going to, we're not going to let, you know, billionaire owners dictate the end of base of pro baseball in Oakland. You know, it's been out here since since eighteen since eighteen ninety six, um, and we're not gonna let that die. And sure enough, I didn't think it was gonna happen this fast. And Paul and Brian met with us, and they said, you know, how do you feel about about you know coming and cheering again uh, uh, with this ball club? And they've always told me that that if if we if they didn't have the blessing of sixty eight, that they don't think they would have done it. So um, <clears throat> we're pretty we always are in talks we're always they're they're always open to any ideas that we have whether it's ballpark events um or anything they can do around the community and and sure enough we we've kind of good a good relationship a good partnership you know when whenever there's cleanups whenever there's a, a an event we're always there and we're always supporting supporting them um we're always we're also trying to figure out this you know maybe how we can do a fan ownership and the first ever in, in, in baseball history, you know, so uh, we're, we're kind of always working together, working to kind of put Oakland first all the time, kind of like similar to the roots. And so uh, it's, it's been good. Awesome. Well, I've never been through, you know, what, what you all are, are going through, you know, I know it's not the same. My grandfather was a Philadelphia A's fan and, and uh, oh. it, he he would tell the story about uh, you know when they left and how devastating that was and they you know he he eventually became a a Philadelphia Phillies fan but it wasn't immediate right like it was it right. was something that he talked about a lot he had a purple jacket with an elephant on it that was just awesome I remember that jacket and you know this this franchise it just seems to leave a a path of destruction in its wake here so it's uh, I, I feel terrible yeah. for what you all have gone through as as fans with your your major league team but I love what you've created with uh you know with the 68s and with the soul and the roots and now the ballers i think this is you know really a a bright future for oakland so i appreciate you coming on and and talking about it where can people go to support the 68s and uh and the work that you're doing and and maybe become a member for as little as a five dollar donation yeah that's correct so uh you know go to oakland 68.org um and and you know just kind of Go all over that website and and check what what we do and 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 we do a lot for the community, not just 
sports, like I said. You know, I, I volunteer as a as a soccer coach at a local high school out here. Um, uh, other members volunteer for the Alameda County Food Bank. Um, we we've, we've done collaborations with uh, uh, with um, Eat Learn Play. Um, we've done other other things with other nonprofits. We've raised backpacks for for uh, um, schools out here in Oakland. So. Check out our website, Oakland68.org, and um, or and follow us on Twitter at Oakland68, um, and on Instagram as well. Um, and and also, you know, we we also want to show love to like Last Dive Bar, um, Oaklandish, 951, everyone that's kind of helped us along along uh, um, this this struggle. Almost, you know, it's a struggle. It's bit, it's bittersweet because we met so much amazing people um, uh, along the along the road, but. Um, yeah, so check us out. Keep uh, keep in touch with our events and and help us keep on fighting. We have we have one uh, huge kind of protest fight. Uh, it's on uh, September first. It's we will we're gonna show up at San Francisco uh, Museum of Art of Art of Modern Art, and they they want exhibits of of like of, of art and sports in the Bay Area, and so we're gonna show up there too as well. Well, you said, uh, you know, you talked about the the work that you're doing with, uh, you know, different organizations in the city and that this this episode will be up before that uh, demonstration takes place in September. So, uh, you know, if you're in the area, go check it out. But just noodling around your website, I noticed that you uh, also partner with Play Proud, which is, per their website, providing safe spaces for LGBTQ plus communities. And that's featured prominently on your website. So, the uh, the inclusive right. environment that you all are creating there is really fantastic, and so I would definitely encourage that everyone go go check it out. And if you're hey, if you're around in in San Francisco in September, go be part of that demonstration. Sounds amazing. Thank you very much, Paul. All right, thanks, Jorge. Have a great one, and and best of luck to you and the Ballers. Maybe I'll catch you at a at a at a Pioneer League game, and we will catch a knockout round together sometime. Heck yeah, my <laughs> my might be on the twenty third. There you go. We'll see you in Northern Colorado on August 23. Jorge, thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Paul. Have a good day. Hey, everyone. It is time for Studio Simon Stumpers with my good friend Dan Simon of Studio Simon in Louisville, Kentucky. Dan is taking a break from all of the creating of amazing logos that he does for the world of minor league baseball to bring us a trivia question as he does every single week. Dan, good morning. How are you? Good morning to you, Paul. I am fantastic. Thank you. This is a uh, this is a little bit of a different episode because we got into more than just the brand of the team. We certainly got into, you know, what what the brand of the Ballers team is, but we we got into the sort of culture of sports in in Oakland. And really, you know, what, what Oakland fans are going through right now as a as a fan base, losing their major league teams, really embracing, uh, you know, the the men's and women's soccer teams that exist out there. And of course, this Oakland Ballers team. So uh, this this has been an, an interesting episode. And the Ballers brand is is an interesting story to me. So I'm curious to see. What all of that amounts to when it comes to you and your studio, Simon Stumper, for the week? Okay, let's do it then. Uh, something I would imagine a number of the listeners of the Baseball by Design podcast know or understand is that if you are an affiliated minor league team, there there is a, a rule in Major League Baseball. I guess it, it it's a territorial thing that you cannot have another team within a certain mile radius of a major league stadium. Um, so for instance, when the Arizona Diamondbacks were about to play their first season in the Phoenix area, there was a team in Phoenix, a minor league team, I believe it was the San Francisco Giants affiliate, the Phoenix Firebirds, and they had to leave. They had to leave Phoenix because they could not play in the same city as the now the major league team that was moving there. I believe it's something like 35 miles. You cannot be within a 35 mile radius. It might even be 25. I don't know that for certain, but there is definitely a rule like that. 
That happened as well here in Colorado with the Denver Bears turned Denver Zephyrs, who moved to New Orleans when the Colorado Rockies came to town. And then the Denver Zephyrs became the New Orleans Zephyrs, became the New Orleans Baby Cakes, became the Wichita Wind Surge. Look at that. <laughs> uh, that's very good. You got you follow the 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 lineage there. Uh, so anyway, now we've got this team, the Oakland Ballers, playing proverbially right down the street from the Oakland Alameda Coliseum, and listeners might be thinking, "Well, how how is that? How are they able to do that?" Well, simply put, they are not an affiliated minor league team. They are an independent minor league team. They are not part of Major League Baseball, so they're not governed by Major League Baseball's rules. They could put they could put a team literally next door if they were able to build a stadium next door to a Major League team and play there. So that's how the um, that's how the Oakland Ballers get to play in the city of Oakland while there's a Major League team still there for now, at least. That was a, a point of conversation in the Philadelphia area, too, when we had the Camden River Sharks playing right across the river from the Philadelphia Phillies. And you had this beautiful ballpark with this view of the the bridge uh, going into Philadelphia there. And when the River Sharks folded, there was some conversation about would the Phillies allow one of their affiliates into that ballpark? Like, would would one of the teams that you know was a Phillies affiliate move to Camden? because it was this beautiful ballpark and the River Sharks weren't playing anymore. I think the Williamsport Crosscutters were sort of the main candidate for that. And uh, it didn't happen. Uh, the Phillies, I don't think they, I don't think they released those rights and none of the Phillies franchises moved anyway. Uh, but that was, I remember that was a conversation in Philadelphia because, you know, you could, you could hit the Phillies ballpark with a long home run from uh, the Camden River Sharks ballpark. Well, there, there are examples of that very thing happening. Um, you've got the Brooklyn Cyclones, who were a Mets affiliate. They are within that territorial range, but the Mets said, "Hey, we welcome you here." Yeah, or Saint Paul Saints, Brooklyn. Saint Paul Saints is another example. The, the the Staten Island Yankees, who were net, who are no longer the Staten Island Yankees, but the Yankee New York Yankees um, gave them the permission to play within their territory, um, and then there was also for one or two seasons before one of those, either the Brooklyn or the Staten Island ballpark were built, there was the Queens Kings. Do you, mm. Are you familiar with them? A Todd Radom classic, uh, the one hit wonder, the one season wonder Queens Kings. Absolutely. Right. So there were times that, uh, that the major league team will, will waive that rule and welcome somebody within their territory, but not usually. Um, so anyway, how does this, uh, lead to a stumper. Well, unlike the Oakland Ballers, who actually play in the same city as a major league team, there are other minor league teams that, although they have a major league city in their official team name, they are lying liars who lie <laughs> as they don't actually play in that city. Mm. Okay. All so right. Lying liars today. who lie. Yes. That's a, like the Al Franken book, Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them. Yes, that's where I got that from. <laughs> I thought that was such a great title for a book. Got I got to love I love me some uh, some Al Franken. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so here's today's studio Simon Stumper. Only one of these independent minor league baseball teams is actually located in the same city as their nearby major league neighbor. Hmm. Is it A, the Milwaukee Milkmen? B, the Kansas City Monarchs, or C, the Dub C Fish Sticks? Oh, this is such a good question, Dan. This is a really fun one. Now, this I don't know if this will require a point of clarification here. The Kansas City Monarchs play in Kansas City, Kansas. They don't play in Kansas City, Missouri, where the Kansas City Royals play. So they do actually play in Kansas City. It's just not the same Kansas City as the Kansas City Royals. For clarification purposes, okay. The question, as the question is written, um, they, it says that they don't actually play in the same city. Okay. So, 
So the Kansas City Monarchs do not play in the same city as the Kansas City Royals because they are in Kansas and the Royals are in Missouri. So disqualifying, discounting the Monarchs, the Milwaukee Milkmen, I feel like is going to be the correct answer because I believe that Dub C, if we're counting Dub C as being Seattle, because Dub C is a neighborhood in Seattle, I believe. But they don't call themselves the Seattle Fish Sticks. They call themselves the Dub C Fish Sticks. And Dub C is just a nickname. It's not an official designation. So, so if, it's not. Let oh, me sorry, just, yeah. let me, some additional clarification. Okay. Even though their name is not Seattle, it is you know, their their geographic designation is not Seattle, it's Dub C. The question is not about the name. The question is, do they play in the same city ah. as their major league neighbor? Okay, okay. So, so now the question is, Dub C, a neighborhood of Seattle, is it, a, is it formally, officially Seattle? And Milwaukee, do they play in Milwaukee proper or do they play on an outskirt? I am going to go with, I believe that the Dub C Fish Sticks play in Seattle. Final answer. Final answer. Dub C Fish Sticks are in Seattle. They are not a lying liar. <laughs> Who lies? Who um, lies? Paul Caputo, we are giving you a cigar. You are correct. And you, your, you, your distinction there that Dub C is a neighborhood is exactly the case. Um, the Dub C Fish Sticks Mel Olson Stadium um, and the Seattle Mariners T-Mobile Park are both in Seattle, Washington. Dub C stands for, as you said, West Seattle. I don't know if you said that. but I didn't say that out loud, actually. No, but... Okay. Uh, but, but Dub yes. for W, C for Seattle, um, S-E-A-C. Um, but but it's not a separate city. It's a conglom. It's actually a conglomeration of neighborhoods in in a Seattle. So the um, the Kansas City Monarch Monarchs Legends Field is in Kansas City. But as you pointed out, it's Kansas City, Kansas. Whereas the Kansas City Royals Kauffman Stadium is in Kansas City, Missouri. And lastly, we've got Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Milkman's Franklin Field. It is only 11 miles from the Milwaukee Brewers American Family Field, formerly Miller Park, um, but they play in Franklin, Wisconsin. So today you are a winner, Paul. It was a little bit of a coin flip there because I was I, I was trying to think like, is West Seattle actually a distinct town from Seattle? And the Milwaukee Milk Manor is, is the one I know the least about. I've never written about them for sports logos. And I've never visited them. I've never looked them up for baseball palooza. So that was that that was a little wild card there. Uh, the Kansas City Monarchs, I knew of, I've been to a T-Bones game and I've been to a Monarchs game. And I have very distinct memories of uh, crossing the river from one state to the other to to get to that ballpark there. So, uh, Dan, that was that was a that was a great studio Simon number. That was a fun one. You're raising your finger because you have one more thing. <laughs> yes. I just want to say uh, another team that could have been one of the potential answers to this is the Chicago Dogs, which have been featured on this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, a, an identity created by a friend of the show, Sky Dillon. Um, the Chicago Dogs do not play in the city of Chicago. They play in a suburb, Rosemont, Illinois. The Chicago Dogs... I remember because usually on baseball palooza, you know, we we all fly into a city, you know, and and we try to align the flights as best we can. But sometimes we'll we'll fly in and there'll be, you know, maybe three hours between, you know, the first flight landing and the last flight landing. We'll find an airport bar and just hang out. But what we did when we were in the Chicago land for baseball palooza was we the the Chicago dogs are literally across the street from the airport. And so we found a bar outside the stadium and we all gathered there. If your flight landed, you left the airport and you walked to the bar across the across the street that was outside the Chicago Dog Stadium. And then we saw a dog's game on the first night of the of baseball palooza. And that dog's game famously 
was interrupted. I believe I've told this story on the podcast before. That that dog's game was interrupted by a Pink Floyd laser show at precisely nine o'clock because I believe that the city of Rosemont had some very specific regulations about when they could and could not do their Pink Floyd laser show. And so it was literally not joking in the middle of an at bat, they walked out and took the pitcher off the mound and did the Pink Floyd laser show. And 15 minutes later, they all came back out and resumed the game. It was a, uh, it was very funny independent baseball moment. You know, that, that would, uh, I could see, uh, uh, you know, some, a, a news item or, you know, you scrolling <laughs> through your news feed and the, the time Pink Floyd interrupted a, uh, a, a professional baseball game. Dan, this was a fun one. Thank you so much. We will see you again next week. In the meantime, go find Dan on Instagram at studio underscore Simon and not on X or Twitter. Dan, we'll see you next week. Okay, see you then.